Froth with a whiskey. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. Uh, I know I should have done the whiskey after the presentation, but there you go. So, um, yeah, we basically have a great tagline, two guys talking shit in a bar and drinking whiskey, but we do talk about Office 365. It's a very chilled out podcast, um, and uh, we're always having feedback. And we actually had our first virtual whiskey one-inch party this weekend. So we've been talking about it for a while. If you do drink a lot of whiskey, I know I'm, I'm onto whiskey now, but you know that last inch in the bottle of a really good whiskey that you don't ever want to finish? So we decided to have a party where we uh, everybody brought their favorite whiskey and uh, told us about it. And then the winner actually got uh, a couple of samples of my Swiss Mountain, which is another very interesting whiskey that was actually matured for seven years in a glass in the glass here uh, in Switzerland at a constant minus four degrees. And it makes a, a really interesting dip. Anyway, that's not what we're here for. But if you want to hear about Office 365 at a fun level, then that is the podcast to listen to. And I guess that's turned itself off. And here we go. All right. So we are ensuring high value Microsoft Teams. This is a kind of adoption talk. This is about how we take that wonderful agile tech technology and changes and processes and turn it into MS Teams and turn that into value for the business. So there's a couple of quotes that I like to refer to. Here's one of them. Uh, Sean Geraghty is a, a UX guy, and he says the technology you use impresses no one. And this is a tech conference. Be honest, if you are teaching your business tech, they aren't going to be impressed. However, the experience you create with it is everything. And from the guy that invented WordPress, technology is best when it brings people together. And hey, that's exactly what we're doing with MS Teams. So those are my guiding lights. So. This is me, Cy Steve from CIIS Business Consultancy. I've had this company for about 20 years. If you Google Cy Steve, then uh, you'll pick up most of my stuff now. I've been around for a while. And we're basically going to talk about talking, messaging, meeting, listening, watching, drawing, all the stuff that can be done in MS Teams. This is the boring slide. There you go. I've been in this game way, way too long. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I'm into Formula One and whiskey. Uh, I've got lots of kids and grandkids. The podcasting is a, a real thing. Uh, I've done my stint as an IT director for a dot com and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I got a lot of background on this, but I'm not going to read them out. I'll just let you uh, to look at it. All of these slides are obviously online as well as the notes, because a lot of these slides have just got one word in. You're just going to listen to me talking. And I've got 610 slides to get through and only another 32 slides to go. So let's just take a look at this. So this is the problem with MS Teams. It's like controlling water. And as you know, from the last few months, controlling water is not actually easy to do. There's roads still up in Europe and there's floods, of course, constantly. And you can see we're, we're controlling the water as it leaves at one end, but at the other end, there's a certain inconsistency as it starts to fall apart. But it can be guided. And in my opinion, as far as MS Teams are concerned, that's all we can do. We can tell our users how to use it. We can tell them what they can do with it. But if they don't quite agree with you, this product is so complex, they'll find a way of doing exactly what they want to do with it. But we can guide them. And that's about as far as we're going to get. There's only one technical slide in here for a technical conference. And that's when I list you the 16 ways of managing MS Teams. And then I spend 20 minutes talking about each one of them at another presentation. I want to talk about this. Value. Now, when MS Teams was released, we kind of pushed it out as IT. Yeah. Hey, latest, greatest thing from Microsoft, guys. You've got to start using this. Actually, just checking. How many end users do we have here? None. Cool. Anybody awake? No? Yeah. Excellent. All right. So as far as we're concerned, we don't see the value of MS Teams. Because for us, it's a tool. It's an application. This is probably the same as SharePoint. It's probably the same as Outlook. It's an application to do a job. So the challenge that we have from a technical perspective is really about how we make it work. The trials are how to ensure it's secure. And there's relief when people actually connect to, to each other and talk and it works. 
and then we can go home and relax having spent 24 hours doing it. But from an agile perspective, value is defined as relative worth, merit or importance or the usefulness of something to keep it simple. So as we start to go through this presentation, let's think about MS Teams and how we define the value that it brings to the business and how as technical people, uh, how is IT running that? That's what we're going to focus on. So the problem is that how do you measure value? Well, there's a, a Japanese guy, Kano, Nariaki Kano, who's a Japanese researcher in 1980, and basically came up with a concept that value is defined as how satisfied you are, okay? So, you know, start from really pissed off, this is crap, to, hey, this is brilliant and I love it, okay, on the left-hand side. And then there's a relationship and a proportion of how many features are available in MS Teams. So if I asked you to tell me the number of features, capabilities MS Teams have, would you be able to tell me? I mean, now, precisely, I know Microsoft has got, yeah, I mean, there's loads, aren't there? Okay. Um, and the last presentation, of course, uh, was trying to list them. Interestingly enough, when you bring these things together, you end up with one of those magic Harvard two by two matrices. And so what we're obviously trying to do here to get full value is up in that top right hand side, have very, very happy users uh, with lots and lots of features. OK, so that's what makes sense. So that's Kano. We're going to return to this a little bit later on. So let's have a look at some of those features. Oh, just a second. I've got a call coming in. Oh, Frank. Good. Yes, yes, yes. You're, you're calling me to thank me about how well MS Teams was rolled out. Yeah, yeah, no, it went quite well. Somebody had to put the package together and um, no, no, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just dealing. Somebody was was asking for some help. Um, yeah, it was uh, uh, seventh. You mean I need to call you, sir? Oh, Sir Frank. Sorry, boss. Yes, okay. So yes, yeah, seven thousand machines on the desktop, and they rolled out. Yeah, just hold on a second. Um, risk. Emphasize the calendar out. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, we had to reconfigure the firewalls. We had to make sure that UDP worked, but that was kind of the network team. Uh, oh, just a second. I've got a notification coming in. Oh, yeah, I've got a, a team meeting um, and messaging. Um, and, of course, MS Teams is a little bit like this. It's constantly getting our attention more than email ever used to do. And how many people are pissed off with email? So how many of you have asked your users whether they want to be able to receive more than one call at the same time, or does it just not make any sense? Do you know what the default setting is for MS Teams on incoming calls? So if I'm in a conference call, can I receive a phone call? Yes. Should I receive the phone call? Do the users want to receive the phone call? If you're in the sales department, they want to receive the phone call. They don't care. They at least want to be able to see that it came in. So there's a lot of numbers of things here around these features that may not make sense to everybody. But as you can see, if we were trying to roll all these things out and manage them, there is, well, this is a good word to describe it, isn't it? It's somewhat complex. So think about your business. Think about MS Teams. Think about how we define what that value is. Personas in your organization. I don't know what your organization is, but in mine, we have salespeople. We have people defining bank applications for our customers. We have people doing um, thousands and thousands of financial transactions a day. We have help desks supporting people. We have HR and all those kinds of things. And they all have different kinds of personas with different kinds of requirements. Now, I'm not teaching you something you didn't already know. You know what personas exist. But if we start to think about that terrible word hybrid, and yes, I have a slide with the word hybrid on it in a minute. We'll come back to that in a second. These different people have different meeting needs. So tech support's meeting needs will be different to a manager's meetings needs. Even we think basics. Tech support, what kind of features are they going to use in MS Teams? Screen sharing, taking over the other persons. Would a manager do that? No. So there are different requirements there. Different people have different collaboration needs. Administrators and C-level people 
You know, they have different ways of managing documents. Administrators may well work and co-author together on a document. C-level are just going to read and hit the approval app and say, yeah, I like that. Different people have different calling needs. The purchasing people and the sales people, they have different requirements from their MS teams. Now, if we talk about those as different meeting profiles, at a high level, how many different meetings do we have? One-to-one -one meetings, one-to-many meetings, many-to-many -many meetings. Um, I had two clients this week, both of them independently. One's in Belgium and one's actually in uh, Nottingham. Um, they came to me and said, okay, all right, we're going back to work and all that kind of stuff. How, in whatever the new normal is going to be, do I get my community back? How do I get my team back? We used to be a really strong sharing collaborative team. And you look at Harvard and some of those reviews they're doing and they say, People working from home, there's been no drop in admin in, in efficiency and all that kind of stuff. And potentially, as from a personal basis, they're right. But when it comes to collaboration within teams, there's actually been quite a lot. Both of these clients said to me they estimated about 40% drop, all right, in the efficiency that they had, on the basis that, you know, one's a software house that supports 15 or 20 high-level e-commerce e packages so bugs they could go downstairs hey that needs to be done now and that's much more difficult when they're remote uh, another one was an architect's organization and they're really trying to work out you know uh, how my design meeting can be taken from a car with a phone and bottom line is that it can't so those variables we have here around the different types of meetings in ms teams all need to be addressed and we know there are different ways of doing it Let's add a few more variables in here. The profiles of the meetings. So just the numbers is one thing, but in a, an architect's meeting about design, they kind of want to pull a model out or they want to do a, a rendered model and share it. They want to draw on the model. They kind of want to say to a client, this is what the building will look like. Technical support will have a different requirement. So the only real way that you know what value your organization needs to do is to actually profile the meetings. And that means go talk to people. A meeting is not just about accept and click. So within this architect's organization, I asked them what kind of meetings they had. And so they said, there are client meetings. They're, well, that's fine. So he said, and we don't really have a lot of problems with those, except they tend to be on construction sites. So I am in my nice office in Antwerp and I've got guys on building sites in remote locations. So part of the work they are looking for me to do is to define what that looks like on the construction site from devices, equipment and all those kinds of things. They have meetings, team meetings. They have 25 meetings in one people in one country, 25 people in another country. How do we get that community spirit and bring those people together to feel like one team every Monday morning for you know, their review and kickoff and sharing? And we haven't got answers for those. We know technically we can get them on and we have a bigger camera with a wider lens, that kind of stuff. So this hybrid stuff here gets worse when we start adding in different devices, phones, tablets, Surface Hubs, um, all of the Microsoft Teams devices. Some of them will do the things that they want to do in design a meeting, some of them won't. So now instead of saying, yes, I will accept that meeting, that person now needs to be told, okay, you can accept that meeting if you're in the office because it's a design meeting and you will need to have pen, whiteboard, or the ability to see the models. You can't do that from a car where you might need to, you know, brainstorm around things and actually take part in uh, whiteboarding and that kind of stuff. I can't do that sitting at the airport. I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but it's the kind of things that we need to know. So we have those variables. Then we get that sodding word again. Okay, it's on all the boards, it's all fashionable and it's all good to go, but it's not a technical solution, people. It's not. Hybrid is going to add an extra layer of adoption to your teams when they start to settle back in again. I've talked about those uh, ideas of where the location is, the type of meeting is, and I'm sure there are technical aspects to all of this. But from an adoption perspective, if I was the major partner in an accounting company and I'm trying to share a spreadsheet 
but the guy that owns that spreadsheet is operating from a car in the airport or the lounge at the airport or uh, is at home and his bandwidth is playing up. Um, I'm wasting my time as a partner and the other people of the team are just not looking so cool. So depending upon the content may also have a value. So this hybrid stuff, it's not about clicking accept and it's more when I click, I'm going to accept this meeting is OK. Will I actually be in there? Will I be able to take part? Because I know in that particular meeting uh, there's going to be things that I need to be able to do from certain devices. And so that adoption process of using MS Teams and getting the value out of it is also part of that conversation. So what do we need to consider then if we take all of those things together about adding value into MS Teams? So who are my personas? I don't want 25 of them. Let's just get five or six of them. Understand the people that use MS Teams a lot, either to make phone calls or to collaborate over content, which is probably more a SharePoint thing or actually in office nowadays. I don't need to think about Teams. Uh, video calls. Is it a brainstorming meeting, the type of meeting? So think about the meeting profiles and you're starting to work out that we're kind of getting this matrix here now, aren't we? A little bit like when you're buying software. Um, I can pay this monthly fee and I get these features and I can pay this monthly fee and I can get those features. Build that matrix for your users and your user base. and Remember value? So maybe it's not actually doing as much as possible. It's about finding the right functionality that my business needs with the highest value that they need. It's not about the maximum and the most. It's about getting there. All right, I told you there was one technical slide. It's coming up, get yourself ready. I was told this is a technical conference, okay? But anyway, there's one technical slide. Um, there are a bunch of tools in Teams. How many people remember Teams first coming out? Yeah, and you remember the admin, how blank that admin page was. And if you compare what it looks like now. And if you ask any of the Microsoft people, and you look at any of the roadmap, some of the features are going to require additional administration. Any idea of how many uh, policies that are available in the administration? I didn't. I actually had to go and count, but I was surprised. There are 16 policy setting sections in your administration. OK, and I'm including these two here, organization and settings. Has anybody ever looked at policy packages? Yeah, have you used it? No. OK, it's, it's actually quite cool, I think, once you get in there. But all of these settings are all of the things that you're going to need to think about and consider when we talk about the complexity of actually doing MS Teams. Now, why am I talking about this? Because within IT, we deliver service. And if you're doing it properly, ITEL and all that kind of stuff, you need to have service descriptions. And unless we do this and actually say, hey, these are the type of the meetings that we will support, then we actually don't have a service description. If we do have a service description, then you need to work out which of these wonderful policies here need to be adjusted. And trust me, all right, some policies will stop you setting other aspects of the policies, okay? And some policies within your tenant will also uh, affect MS Teams. One that caught me out three or four weeks ago um, was uh, somebody said to me, hey, if I go to MS Teams and I want to join a public team, I should just get all of the public teams listed. Not just listed, listed, okay. And so I said, yeah, of course you can. And I took him through and he went, ah, nobody's created a public team yet. No, that's not true. Because And he gave me the list and that was fine. It was the Euro 2 2020 he was trying to find. So I started digging around. Has anybody had this problem before? No, you were going to learn something new. What was the answer? No, well, I thought that that was my first thing. But actually, you remember Microsoft released this opportunity, this issue about being able to separate data. So in exchange, for example, you can say, look, this is all people that like, you know, dealer rooms and these are all the mergers and acquisitions and they must never. As soon as you turn that feature on, then you lose the ability to share public rooms. And I was going, why? And so now, of course, I've got to start going back to the business today. OK, you've got a couple of choices here. Uh, but in fact, to be fair, typical bank, they just said, yes, that's a good idea. Let's do data separation. No governance. Just let's check the box. And then we lost all the public sites. 
So anyway, um, if you do download the sides, all of these policy settings are, are listed um, with all their brief descriptions, but you know you can go through the admin and, and see them. This policy packages here, I do need to look at that a bit more myself because I think here we can kind of shortcut having to keep changing these. It allows you to create a kind of uh, a remote shortcut which will adjust settings in the different policies depending where you go. So uh, I need to look into that myself. But this is your technical friend in terms of moving it forward. Okay. Now, this presentation is about defining value. Any questions on value? You get this. You can ignore it, of course. You don't have to do anything that I want. But if somebody says, why do I have to use his teams? It would have been good if you'd said, well, actually, these are the values that the business say they're going to get to it. And you could surprise the hell out of your business by actually asking them, what value do you want out of MS Teams? And they'll go, you've never asked me that before. Well, Steve Dolby said at the last conference it was a good idea, so I thought I'd follow it up to see whether you get any feedback. Chances are you'll get zero, but it is worth asking the question. Okay, MS Teams has always been different on the others. You know, you don't go and tell them what value do I want out of Outlook or what value do you want out of Word or Excel or SharePoint maybe, but that's more app-based. But MS Teams actually does need that level of refinement to be able to make it effective and efficient in the business. Um, otherwise, I think at the end of the day, some people will use it or they'll just start using it for messaging. And there are cheaper tools and easier tools to manage if that's all they are using. All right. So the second part of this presentation, uh, this talk was about how you manage those. So if you can imagine, if we conservatively say there's 10 settings amongst all of those policies, then there's 160 combinations of settings we can have. And if I'm trying to build or roll out MS Teams, I don't really want to have to wait till I've done all of that settings before I do MS Teams. So effectively, I want to kind of do the things that are secure, get those done, push Teams out, and then start to build the features up. How many people work in an agile organization? None of you. Excellent. Oh, you get the full lecture then. Sorry. <laughs> you can go if you want. All right. Now, very, very quickly, because I don't have much time left. The, the point of agile software development is about delivering what we call the minimal viable product and get it out to the business ASAP so that they can tell me about what? It's value. Thank you, sir. Whiskey for you later. All right. Yeah. So they can say this is valuable or it's not valuable or it would be more valuable. Oh, I'm listening now. It would be more valuable if you could make it do this, please. So the agile process is about getting the minimum out there and then identifying where the value is. All right. So. How do we define value? In the Agile process, and I'm not going to go into it too big, we have something called a product backlog. Okay, And a product backlog is a task list, but those tasks are user stories. That's okay, my friend. Off you go. All right, cool. I have a bladder like that as well. I just It just catches me any time. All right. So user stories. And the, if you read this one here, any one of these two on the right-hand side, they're telling you what the user is expecting. Now, I'm sure our task lists are, hey, turn on breakout rooms, turn on this, create a help sheet and that kind of stuff. But if we did that and the user said, yeah, but what do I do with it? I have no idea. But what we do have is some great little user stories. And those user stories, what gets put into our backlog? And those backlog is then listed, nice, small, short things that we need to do. Usually we can do them in a couple of weeks and we then talk to the managers and the managers and we say, hey, which ones of these shall we do? We'll, we'll talk about priorities in a moment or two. We then feed that into the backlog and I'm not going to spend a lot of time through this, but this is the agile process. So on the left hand side, you see the product backlog. On the right hand side, you see something called an increment. OK, and if I go back, what we wanted was. As a user in sales, I want to be able to initiate a conference call and share any document on the screen, but not let the customer take away a copy. That's quite clear, isn't it, what we need to do? So what the team will do is we'll take that off the backlog because, hey, we're going to do that in this sprint. 
We'll put it into the planning. We'll do some refinement before it gets to this point. So the techies will get together and they'll say, okay, so what was it again? So, um, so we can get the conference call. That's all right. That's already working. I can share a document. Yeah, we've got sharing on there, but not let the customer take a copy. Okay, so we need to make sure that we've taken uh, external sharing off. Uh, we may need to talk to our proxy guys to actually say, look, I want you to let this through, but don't actually let them save it. We might need to go into DLP or compliance and security within our tenant. But I know what the settings are now for all of this because that's what I have to achieve. So I deliver it. The Scrum team gets together. We know what we have to deliver and we deliver it. And then we say to the customer, hey, it's now working. And they go, whoopee. All right. If it's a really big one, they go, okay, now that's brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. We've been waiting for months for that. Why do you know? Yeah, well. So they get to look at it and they tick it off and you move forward. And that is basically the agile process. Lots of small things clearly defined to move forward. So I did say there's a thing about priority because uh, my time is running on, so as you can hear, I'm talking a little quicker. But I have maybe 60 items in my product backlog, all of those user stories, and they're so easy to collect. And so where you have a workshop and a, you know, a, a requirements gathering process, you end up with a long document, this is a user story. A user can say, in sales, I want to be able to do the following, or in finance, I want to be able to do the following. It's a nice, easy sentence. So I have to decide which ones I do. And this is the product owner's role uh, of an agile team. And they talk to the business and decide which is most important. But you can come up with a very simple process for this. You can sit there and say, OK, look, I'm going to measure this. So how many of these are going to be affected? Well, we're mostly salespeople. So, yeah, we've got more users. We've got, yeah, we have meetings on a regular basis or with customers. Uh, I can actually save time here. So I'll give it a number. I can then ascertain a business value. And I can say, okay, of these two items in the coming sprint, and I've only got enough resources to do one, I'll do the one that's got the highest value. And the business is not going to sit there and say no. Well, actually, they might. They might actually, of course, you get the director, sales director come in and say, no, this business is not right. But can you reverse those? And I don't care. It's the business. You tell me which one to do first. So we just prioritize them with some simple process. If you don't know what agile is, and if you're frightened of agile, it really is this simple, okay? Um, you come up with just simple, easy, measurable process to define the important things that you need to do, and you do the ones that deliver the most value. And if our users are going to use any kind of application, in this particular case, MS Teams, you want it to deliver the most value to them. Now, we have two items here. One's for, what did I say, finance? I can't remember. Uh, and, and one's for sales, okay? Um, sales is possibly most important to the organization. So I can just do that. I don't even have to deal with anybody else if that's the way I want to work MS Teams. So I can make those choices because I've broken it down into small iterations of work and information. All right. So uh, just a few reminders uh, of where we're going with this. Hybrid is not just a tech solution, okay? You need to think about the people, the types of meetings, where those meetings are going to take place, what they need to do. Think about your personas, the people that are going to use it. Um, meeting profiles really are a must, okay? I know we've all turned it on and said, hey, you can now do conference calls and you can now do meetings, okay? But if you actually go and talk to your business and say, how many of those meetings were valuable they may well say, well, actually, 12% of them we had to cancel or reschedule for lots of reasons. And without knowing what those 12% are, it's so easy to say, yeah, the user's bandwidth was to blame. Let's just move on. The next one worked okay. But I tell you, your execs will start to get pissed off for a while, especially if they're the ones trying to get some information on a Teams meeting that has not worked. And very often, as IT, we go, well, you should never have took that meeting from the train traveling at 120 mile an hour through Switzerland. Well, nobody told me. Well, I'm telling you now because we have these profiles. So that's my thoughts on how we ensure that MS Teams has a level of value. And I would just, whilst we have any questions from these 200 people here in the theater, uh, just pull up those two quotes again, just to remind you, the experience you create with it is everything. Okay, that is my parting shot. Thank you very much.
No questions? There never is a question. If the, if the presentation is really good, you don't need questions. Yeah, go on, I can see the question. I guess I've had uh, uh, varying bad experiences of, of working with other software providers with an agile process, yep. uh, which was usually a uh, euphemism for just breaking stuff. <laughs> so I guess what what from the, from uh, with a bit more thought, I guess how can you use the backlog to like explore the interactions between the user stories, where in those two simple examples. Say so they might not want to share externally, and actually, if you just do that one, you might actually break something further down that you've not got to yet. Yeah, I mean, the cloud does not remove the need to have a test environment and a dev environment in some form or another, or just a site collection, um, or um, utilize the policies for a particular kind of group. So, for example, sensitivity labels uh, for encryption and all that kind of stuff, I'm not going to test an encryption on a document because somebody might not be able to decrypt it. So I create a SharePoint group and I've now got an AAD group and I apply that policy to that AAD group and say, go ahead and test it. Same thing here. Every one of those 16 policies can be created just for seven people. So then you can actually test them without having to use it to test environment if you don't, if you haven't got one or you don't need one. So the thing about Agile, and there are three things that the reason you say that, one is that backlog catalog, one is the iteration, the other one is test it and see whether it works. And everybody uses that as an example. Well, if I test it, it doesn't work, then, but the reality is, of course, you've still got ETIL that says service has to be available, et cetera, et cetera. But there are tools with the clouds and a little bit of imagination. That's how I do it. Set a test team up, put them into one SharePoint site, use that AAD group to apply a particular policy and see whether it's changed anything. But I like agile perspective of testing it till it breaks, but do it with only seven people and make sure none of them are important. Anybody else? Let's give a prize then. Am I allowed to enter? <laughs>